this summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Yeah, hello and a warm welcome to the AI for Good Trustworthy AI uh, webinar series. My name is Wojciech Samek uh, from the Technical University of Berlin. And it's a great pleasure to welcome to our speaker of today, Ivan uh, Crothers. Ivan is, is a national security expert and senior machine learning consultant working with the Canadian federal government. His work focuses on protecting trust and online social spaces, countering radicalization and safeguarding democratic elections. So today, Ivan will talk about chat GPT. So Ivan, the floor is yours. Warm welcome. Thanks very much for the introduction, Wojciech. It's great to be speaking to you all today. Uh, I want to start off by bringing you back to October 2022 and a particular photo uh, I took in that month. This is our daughter, Erin, and you may notice she's in a bit of an unusual bassinet here. It, sorry, Evan, just to jump in, are you meant to be showing your screen? Uh, yes, sorry, my goodness, this uh, doesn't make much sense at all if you're not seeing my screen. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Julian, appreciate it. There we go. Are we, are we good now? Can you see my screen? Yep, absolutely. Perfect, thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Anyway, as I was saying, uh, so this talk is is living with ChatGPT, uh, detecting AI text without destroying trust. Um, but we're going to start, and I'm going to bring you back to October 2022 and a particular photo from that. So this is our daughter, Erin, uh, and you may notice she's in a bit of an unusual bassinet here. It's a cardboard box. She's, she's in a cardboard box. Uh, we had a lot of cardboard boxes at the time and, and not a lot of baby stuff. We were moving across the country and our Aaron, our very first kid, was one month old at the point. Uh, it was a very stressful and hectic time in our lives. My wife was at the tail end of an MBA, pushing through her final assignments while learning how to be a mother. Uh, I thankfully had some time off from on parental leave, but only on the side of my job uh, designing AI for the public service. I also have an academic career, so I was conducting my own research and I was working with my uh, with my co-authors, Herna and Natalie, on what we thought was a very important paper. So my wife and I, uh, we improvised. When an evolving disruption, like your first child arrives, uh, we have to adjust our plans and come up with creative solutions along the way. Technology does not wait for you to be ready for it. Uh, it does not wait for you to know how you're going to respond, uh, for you to adjust your organization's mission or your business plan or grapple with how you're going to deal with a new security risk. Uh, when a disruptive technology starts changing the world, before we understand what those changes will be and what harms they might have, um, those, those effects are already happening. Uh, this was true for the internet. It was true for the mobile phone. And generative AI is no different. Uh, the best we can do is to pay attention to what's happening uh, keep the well-being of humans first and, and make the best decisions that we can. And so uh, at my desk with 
Erin in her little box bassinet beside me in October 2022, I, I wrote this paper uh, with the invaluable guidance of my professors. Uh, and it was pure catharsis to write. Uh, this is a topic that's been consuming my mind uh, ever since I first trained a GPT-2 model nearly four years ago and realized what we were in for. Uh, at the time, I was working in countering violent extremism and in protecting elections. And when I realized the data sets I was working with, data sets that were uh, sets of violent threats and hate speech, spam, fake social media accounts, and you realize that someone could use all of this as training data to build something really awful, uh, I've been watching, wanting to write about this topic ever since. Now, uh, my very first piece of public research was on ethical problems in automated influence campaign detection, and GPT-2 was my future work. Uh, but what changed in 2022 and what drove me to write a 35-page survey paper about this is that uh, the interfaces were getting better. Uh, I've got the first two sentences of our abstract, abstract there, and I'll read the second one. Powerful open source models are freely available and user-friendly tools democratizing access to generative models are proliferating. We've had generative models before. Uh, generative models had been around for a while. GPT-2 had a huge impact when it arrived. Uh, GPT-3, another large impact. Um, but we hadn't seen this kind of wave of interfaces before 2022. Um, there were so many different tools that were all wrapping, uh, most of them wrapping the OpenAI API, others um, building their own models. Uh, and these, these systems made these, this technology available to a much, much wider audience than it had ever seen before. Um, before you knew it, uh, if you were on any kind of social media, you would be seeing advertisements for blog writing services, for AI, uh, AI an AI virtual friend, or for a tool to help you write a cover letter. Um, and this was new. Uh, we didn't, uh, before 2022, I mean, some of these things were percolating, they were in the works, but there was such an explosion of user-friendly tools um, that really it became very clear that, that this was going to be a pretty major shift in society. Um, because once a technology uh, as powerful as natural language generation or text generation becomes widely av available, it, it's going to affect all different areas of society. And that's, and that's for good. It's, it's businesses, it's students, it's professors being able to use these tools to help them. It's people being able to use these tools to communicate more efficiently with each other or or um, help people who have struggles with communication to communicate across language barriers or um, with low literacy to write more fluently. But it's also uh, for ill. It's, it's people who are already running uh, cybercrime or, uh, organizations and realizing that they can scale uh, faster and more effectively by using AI to write their phishing emails, or they can um, run their fake review mill um, more effectively at a larger scale by having AI write the text for them. It's uh, It transforms a large number of areas and it creates new opportunities um, for new types of attacks. It creates opportunities for new methods of, of um, interacting uh, with the world around us. So uh, this was in Octo on October 13th, 2022, we released the first version of our survey paper covering both the threat models via generated text and the extent of current detection systems. Uh, we had no idea what was coming. Six weeks later, ChatGPT arrived. Uh, a lot of what we had talked about, um, theorized about, about mass adoption happened pretty much instantly. Um, and that we had, we absolutely did not expect. Uh, before I knew it, uh, my brother-in-law, who was a teacher, was bringing up a specific text generation model in casual conversation. Well, less than casual. He was concerned. He was very concerned. He, he and suddenly had this enormous disruption made to the way that he was doing his work and, and how he thought about um, even the notion of, of assessing a student's writing. Uh, and he didn't want to, he wanted to make sure his students had access to the tool. He wanted to make sure they knew how to use it because it, it was here now. Uh, they were going to have to learn how to live with it. 
but he also wanted to make sure they learned how to write. And, and all of their assignments didn't have in mind the idea that someone could just uh, generate an essay on any given topic fluently. And so he had questions, were there detectors? If the detector was free and online, wouldn't the students just use the detector themselves? Could you even trust the result of a detector? What would happen to a student who got a, a erroneously classified as, as being machine generated text? It, there's so many questions uh, that were spinning around in his mind. And there, are, this is something that I think all of us have kind of been grappling with. Uh, it's not just one area of society uh, and it's it's going to increasingly affect more and more of us in terms of how does this change the way that we work? How does this uh, create new kind of challenges in terms of people using these models when uh, when they probably shouldn't? Uh, cases where we consider it an abuse of the, the technology. Um, and in some cases, uh, there's going to be new tools or maybe new detection systems that we can build that might be able to help us in some way or at least mitigate some of the challenges. Um, but in some cases, we're going to have to also adjust how we do things and find better ways that uh, can work with the uh, work that actually allow us to continue in the, the world that we have now with AI-generated text. Um, if there is a single idea about uh, detecting AI text that you take away from this talk today, uh, I, I'd like it to be the following. And that's that detection systems themselves can cause harm. Um, this is a simple idea. Uh, we will get more into the weeds during this talk. But if you keep this idea in mind, uh, to be careful about the detection systems themselves, you will naturally arrive at better solutions and decisions in building uh, detection systems or in adapting uh, your part of society to dealing with machine generated text. There's just uh, too much potential to make a bad problem worse by carelessly deploying a system that can end up doing more harm than good. Uh, that's not to say that in all cases you shouldn't deploy detection. Uh, absolutely, there's plenty of cases to use it, but you need to put guardrails uh, around how you're implementing that detection. You need to make sure you have uh, processes around it that are reasonable and ethical and actually uh, reflect how accurate current detection systems are. Uh, we can't be making blanket decisions based on a single positive result from a classifier uh, that may or may not be accurate in the domain that we're actually working in. And so we'll go more into this uh, later, but I just want to iterate for those who, who are busy or are distracted, they're working in another tab, detection systems can themselves cause harm. Be careful with your implementation of them. All right, so here's what we're gonna to cover today. Uh, we're gonna to start with a very brief overview of machine generated text. If you're here, I'm gonna assume that you probably know the basics, um, but it's worth clarifying the extent of the field. Uh, there are, uh, it's a very old field and there's actually quite a lot that it covers. And there's some reasons why that's important. Uh, from there, we're going to move on to better understanding some of the threats and challenges that we'll be facing, some of the ways that machine-generated text affects the, the current attacks that exist as far as cybersecurity goes, and also some of the new attacks that it enables. From there, I'd like to provide some actionable advice, not just for data scientists building detection models, but also for people like my brother-in-law who are grappling with how this technology will affect their own part of society. Uh, and yeah, sometimes the answer will be detection systems, but sometimes it'll also be uh, being flexible and adapting uh, to this disruptive new technology. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna go into some key takeaways, summarizing some of what uh, we will cover in the threat models and detection sections, and, and we'll, we'll focus on uh, kind of what actionable advice you might be able to use in your own, um, in your own lives, careers, or um, just, as individuals who now have to cope with this. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll be better equipped to talk about, uh, or to think about how AI text can, can help and hinder in different settings, and what kind of considerations are in play when we think about detection. So without further ado, uh, natural language generation, uh, or it's, I would say more often called these days, text, text generation. 
uh, though the two are considered synonymous, I, I feel like that um, link is starting to, to fray a little bit. Uh, originally, when people were working on this problem, they were very uh, much focused on natural language specifically. Um, a lot of these same models can be used to produce programming languages, which uh, arguably are not natural language at all, um, though there is perhaps some overlap with certain languages. Uh, really, what we're focusing on here, though, is going to be uh, when a machine is producing text as if it were a human, or it's producing text that is the kind of language that a human would write. Uh, we're not going to be looking at, say, uh, code generation models, though there are also plenty of threat models um, related to code generation. Um, obviously, even more threat models if you start imagining a couple technological leaps down the road. Um, we touch on that briefly in our paper, but um, honestly, you could write your own paper just on the, the possibilities of code generation going forward. So uh, when it comes to natural language generation, uh, I think it's incredibly important to realize that AI text is not new and not in a the first chatbot, Eliza, came out in 1966 sense of it's not new. It's it's not new in the sense that mass adoption of generative transformers is also not new. Uh, current versions of popular translation tools, things like Google Translate, use transformer language models, and they have since at least 2020. Uh, these models have similar characteristics to GPT-3 and or ChatGPT, and it is probable that transformer translated text will be detected by the same systems that detect, say, a GPT-3 output or a chat GPT output, at least at a higher uh, rate of, I was going to say false positives, but it's it's not really a false positive, is it? It's still machine generated text. It's just a human wrote all of the ideas and then changed it from one language to another um, with varying levels of accuracy or effectiveness, depending on what languages we're talking about. Some languages are better resourced than others. But that that notion that someone using a translation model may be more likely to get flagged as a false positive should give us pause. And this slide uh, kind of encapsulates why. We're talking about uh, 5.16 billion uh, internet users at the start of 2023, and 32.3% of them aged, aged 16 to 64 have used an online translation tool in the last week. Now, you don't need to have a lot of mathematical knowledge to understand that that's over a billion people likely. Uh, we don't have the exact slicing of that demographic to the overall population of the internet, but that's a huge portion of the internet that relies on online translation tools. And, and where this starts to require some even deeper thought is that uh, this is not a same percentage across the whole board. Uh, the usage of translation tools is not evenly split across countries. For example, 55.5% of users in Colombia have uh, used a translation tool in the last week. Only 16.6% of users in, in Australia have used an online translation tool. And what we see if we break down this data um, is that people in largely monolingual English-speaking countries are all quite low in translation model usage, despite high internet usage in general. Um, and why I pick on English a little bit is because it is the, by several measures, the most common language on the internet. How much of the discourse on the lang uh, on the internet is in English? ChatGPT is producing text in English, uh, and since a significant portion of the global population rely on translation tools to better participate in that global dialogue on the internet, we do humanity a disservice by carelessly. De deploying algorithms that systematically deprive those people of a voice or risk depriving those people of a voice. Giving humans the tools to, to reach across language barriers to interact with others is one of the greatest benefits of large language models. It's something that's absolutely worth celebrating and not hindering with errant detection algorithms. So this really, brings me to, I think, is the uh, another major point uh, that I'd like to, to drive home, and that is that legitimate use of generative language models is 
very hard to separate from malicious use. You can use a translation model for ill. Uh, you can use it to generate permutations of a spam email. You can translate. So if I, I'm, I'm in Canada, I have friends who primarily speak French. If I wanted to create a fake social media user, I could copy their feed and translate everything from French to English. And that would be a way of me creating a, a fake social media user. You can use translation models for ill. Um, and you can use chat GPT to help you write a helpful blog post about parenting. Uh, it's it's not tied, the technology is not good or evil. Um, it is, it's not a matter of translation is good and, and text uh, unconditional text generation is bad or conditional text generation is bad. It's, it's purely that uh, we have to think carefully about the contexts in which these activities take place and whether there are legitimate uses of generative language models in those uh, particular areas. Um, so anytime you are thinking about building a detection system or deploying a detection system, uh, do think to yourself whether there are legitimate uses for generative language models in that context. And ideally get more than just your own opinion about it uh, because it's easy to overlook the needs of others. Um, if we were to build, say, a system that uh, filtered out all emails written with uh, AI bot assistance. Uh, well, pretty soon we may be filtering out all emails. Uh, it seems like those tools are coming very quickly. Um, but uh, even if you were trying to avoid spam written by chat GPT uh, or a similar model, uh, you would risk, say, um, unfairly penalizing someone who's using a translation model to better uh, communicate with someone in a different country or uh, perhaps using a dialogue model like ChatGPT to help them write a professional email because they don't have very strong literacy on their own. Uh, so it's very important to think about whether there are legitimate uses in a particular domain and who you risk uh, impacting uh, if you did remove generative uh, models entirely. And that's assuming you do a good job with your detection. All right. so. Uh, we're going to go into threat models now. That's that's all for natural language generation. Uh, there's definitely more to talk about as far as different types of natural language generation go, but uh, the key idea I wanted to communicate is that it's more than just dialogue models. It's more than just chat GPT. It's more than just GPT-3. Uh, there are a lot of different systems that produce human-like text. Uh, we're now going to move on to these this discussion of threat models and some of the risks posed by machine-generated text. Uh, this is an interesting... A uh, case where I find that sometimes machine learning researchers get more confused than lay people when we talk about threat models. The when we say threat models, we're not saying machine learning models. These aren't um, models that are a threat. Uh, these are this is the output of the cybersecurity process of threat modeling. So threat modeling is something that we do in cybersecurity to better understand uh, the impact that. Uh, a particular set of attack, or you're really trying to identify potential attackers, their capabilities, their objectives, and you're trying to uh, think about your system and what kind of vulnerabilities your system might have. So it's a process of vulnerability assessment in cybersecurity. So the the models in this case are are models. We're modeling the threat here. We're not talking about models that are a threat. This is just some a distinction that sometimes I have to emphasize when I'm talking to machine learning professionals. And I'm sure that we have some in the audience today. So uh, what is threat modeling? Well, it's a very large topic in cybersecurity and there are many different methods. Uh, they range from very rigid formal ones where there are step-by-step -step processes um, that are accredited where you're going through different kind of elements of your stack, your network, et cetera, trying to find what different areas there might be for someone to attack, um, but there's also looser ones as well uh, uh, that are a bit more open-ended. The, the core idea is to find threats to systems and understand attackers, and as I mentioned, capabilities and their motivations. Uh, so this checklist type of style is less useful when we don't have a specific system in mind that we're trying to defend. Uh, so we're going to use a version of a Showstack's four question frame, which is a, a modern approach to threat modeling that is a, a bit more open-ended and less of a checklist. So our threat modeling approach uh, is broken down as follows. We start by identifying uh, what we are working on. Uh, 
So in this case, we're talking about a broad scale analysis of society. Human society uh, is the system under attack in this context. And we're talking about a specific capability. We're talking about machine generated text. How can we use machine generated text to attack society? Um, who would be interested in doing that? And how would that, uh, how would they go about doing that? And then that way we are able to think about how to defend against it. Uh, of course, we can't start by all of society. We have to start breaking it down. Okay, so we're gonna identify individual systems that might be under attack. And so that might be a social media platform. Uh, so it might be a very technical, complex system like that, but it could also be a an essay assignment at a middle school. Uh, and those are both uh, systems under attack. Uh, and so they can also be a non-technical system. So we can have something like, say, a homework assignment being uh, an example of something that we're analyzing. Now, what can go wrong? Uh, so what? who are the potential attackers and what might they be interested in doing? So if we're talking about social media, uh, a potential attacker might be somebody who uh, runs a business, they, they have a competitor down the road, and they want to make sure that their competitor goes out of business. And so I, I run, say, a Putin shop on the corner, and then um, my arch enemy runs a Putin shop down the road, and I want to make sure that um, my store stays in business and his doesn't, so I will get all of his business ostensibly. And so what I do is maybe I, I go online and every time anyone is talking in the community group about um, food, I go in and I mention that this guy doesn't make very good Putin. Uh, that might be an attack. Uh, so if I'm doing that, uh, say with an AI model, I might be able to post a lot of fake reviews for my competitor and therefore uh, benefit from, from their going out of business. Or I might do the opposite. I might say promote my own uh, business online. I might say spam a whole bunch of different community forums with uh, a crypto scam or something like that. I've come up with some idea that if I put, uh, if I send people links on Discord, maybe I can get people to click it. And if I have a bit of a short conversation with them first using a dialogue model like ChatGPT, maybe I get more people involved and more people are more likely to get to buy into my skin. So there's lots of different potential attackers. Um, those attackers might even also be, say, uh, attackers is a, or we're talking about in the cybersecurity context. So we're not necessarily saying that uh, all of these people are are like hackers or cybersecurity experts. These are, these could just be anyone who wants to use this technology to uh, attack an existing system. So that could be a student who is tired and busy and they have an assignment due tomorrow, they need to write this essay. And so instead of writing it themselves, they just put the, the prompt from the teacher into ChatGPT and then they copy paste the output without even reading it uh, into the output, into their essay. Um, all right, so what are we gonna do about it? Uh, we have to find some kind of mitigation strategy and that can be technical or non-technical. So that can be a detection system, that can be trying to find what uh, different tools or systems we can use to uh, detect uh, whether or not somebody is actually using these models. Uh, but it could also be non-technical. It could be adjusting our processes so that it's not even a problem. If we don't give the student an essay assignment, then they can't use ChatGPT to generate it. Though, then we have to ask, did we do a good job? Um, what is the impact of what we've chosen as our mitigation strategy? Because if you choose a mitigation strategy, it's going to have some effect. And maybe it creates new vulnerabilities. Maybe people might attack your detector. Maybe your detector can be easily bypassed. Or maybe if you're not giving essay assignments anymore, maybe you're starting to undermine your original objective or your mission. Maybe you're not um, doing education uh, as well as you thought, as you wanted to. So maybe you have to come up with another solution besides that. Or you have to adjust, say, find a different way to accomplish your other goals. So definitely you have to go back and iteratively decide, did you do a good job? And this is an iterative process. You need to repeatedly, after you get through this, it's very useful to start at the top again and go, okay, well, in light of my mitigation, what is the situation now? So um, we know what threat modeling is. Uh, what are some of the threat models associated with computer-generated text? Uh, there are a great number of them. Uh, and so we've broken them down into a few broad categories and subcategories to better understand them. 
Uh, we have a bit of a taxonomy here uh, summarizing some of the major types of attacks. It is really a gross simplification. There are obvious overlaps between different areas. Uh, different threat actors may use multiple attacks in service of a, a larger goal. Um, but uh, it's useful to break it down this way to better understand it. Uh, as far as the major categories we go through, we tend to have, uh, we've split them into uh, four main branches, one focused around malware and social engineering, one focused around exploiting AI authorship, one focused around online influence campaigns, and one focused around spam and harassment. So uh, in this context, uh, We've broken them down this way, uh, even though there are some overlaps, say, if somebody wanted to perform an online influence campaign, they might uh, generate a large number of op-eds or article submissions and use those for uh, political influence or for a commercial influence campaign. Um, but we're, we're breaking them down this way just because some of these attacks have things in common with each other. And, and when we're talking about uh, spam here, we are talking about um, attacks where uh, volume is a major part of the goal. I'm producing large volume of, of diverse text, uh, as opposed to um, the more general term for spam, where it's just anytime somebody is, say, posting something online that uh, is not very valuable content to the conversation. So, um, which you may find in many of these different uh, attacks. Okay, uh, so let's make this a little bit more tangible. Uh, in order to kind of make this more real, let's uh, let's go through some of the different possible attacks in these different areas. All right. Uh, so let's look at scalable spear phishing. So as far as our taxonomy goes, that would be under this first uh, umbrella that we have here, facilitating malware and social engineering. So it's no secret in cybersecurity that uh, phishing, particularly targeted phishing or spear phishing, is an incredibly effective attack vector. Um, even if you have the most secure IT infrastructure in the world, if humans need to have access to something, there will always be an opportunity to trick those humans into doing something that they shouldn't. So here's a message that might work on me uh, to get me to run arbitrary code from, from a contact on a social media page. It says, hey, long time no talk. I'm working on this new lyrics generation model, kind of similar to a thing that you showed. You want to take a look and tell me what you think. And then they've sent me a link to a GitHub project, but... Um, if I download that model file and run it on my computer, now I'm going to have that give that person access to my machine. Now that's a very uh, specific example, but that's the benefit of spear phishing. Um, by using a model like ChatGPT, these types of dialogue models, we can uh, socialize with a target so that you can develop a pretense before trying to trick them into doing something they shouldn't. And that doesn't have to be downloading a file. That can be uh, entering their credentials on a fake login page or giving someone a Wi-Fi password or even just giving up privileged information over the phone. Um, by having these kinds of uh, conversation models in play, you can have this very long and intricate uh, socialization process whereby you try to deceive someone into giving up the information that you want, uh, which is a major challenge. And, and the way that these models work, taking in uh, previous context and using it as part of the prompt, you could use previous interaction between two people as context for generating your next phishing message. So you could use the right style of, of language. You could use the same nickname. You could use the same kind of method of, like you would break down your messages in the same way as well. You would, if someone sends a lot of little messages, the bot would do that too. And so th this notion of, of of impersonation is, I think, very damaging to the idea of trust. It, the, the, the trust that we have in interactions online begins to decrease even further once you don't even know if you're talking to a human at all. Uh, it's one thing, I mean, uh, I think many people who have used the internet for a long time are used to getting uh, cold call uh, direct messages from chatbots, but you generally can tell it's a chatbot right away. Um, the fact that in the future, this may not be the case, that uh, you can't really tell the difference between someone genuinely reaching out to you and someone deploying a large scale chatbot attack, trying to, to uh, trick you out of some privileged information. A bit of a caveat, though, 
in terms of how these actually uh, would work, uh, there are some challenges to deploying this kind of attack. Um, so if you were thinking about like a, a social worm, uh, where you know one machine gets infected and then it uses that machine and that person's email or or social media to spread itself to that person's contacts. Uh, generative models are quite large, uh, so an attacker would need to query probably a, a separate command and control server in order to do that, uh, which may create some network traffic that then uh, someone working in digital forensics might be able to identify. Um, or if there are is a local model they could use or an open source API, they might leverage that as well. Um, but just something to keep in mind is that it's not trivial to integrate generative models into all of these different attacks and that there are engineering problems that your attacker is trying to solve potentially. And, and as a result of that, um, that may create more signals for us to work with from a cybersecurity defense perspective. Uh, moving on to AI authorship. This one has had a lot of uh, traction recently, um, mostly because of students. Um, students can easily generate essays now, and so people are quite concerned about this. And there's definitely a real academic debate about uh, where you draw that line between what is an acceptable use of a of an AI writing tool and what is an unacceptable use of an AI writing tool. Uh, and but it's not just students who who use these kinds of things. Uh, actually, uh, simple systems for generating scientific papers have been abused by researchers for a very long time. Uh, there was a tool called SciGen back in 2005 that produced a templated nonsense. It just chose pretentious sounding big words and, and threw them into a paper template. And those papers would get accepted at real venues. And it, it was, it kind of showed, uh, highlighted a problem in the way that we uh, thought about uh, the publication process. But uh, people today use those same models to inflate publication counts. They, they use them because they have quotas they need to meet. And so they they turn to this kind of tool. And something like uh, these powerful modern models gives you a lot of new options for generating really spurious research at large scale, um, if that's something you chose to do. And it can be quite difficult to tell. Uh, again, it's difficult to tell between legitimate and malicious usage. Uh, you don't know whether or not somebody is say, it's not necessarily unacceptable to say use chat GPT to help you explain relativity if you know you're just writing your background section in a paper um and there's definitely say an argument about something like cover letters as to whether or not um it's realistic to expect a prospective job applicant to fill out 30 different cover letters so maybe is it reasonable for someone to do that even if the employer considers it an attack um, because the employer ostensibly hopes every cover letter is an earnest reflection of the candidate but um maybe that's it's actually legitimate that some people might want to use a tool to help them deal with the volume of applications they may have to send um, so there's definitely nuance here in understanding uh, legitimate and illegitimate usage and AI authorship um, but this is definitely a large area of, of potential attacks uh, online influence campaigns uh, this one has had uh, some recent uh, attention as well there was a paper that uh, OpenAI released along with some collaborating researchers um there's definitely some uh some good ideas and some ideas i would consider i'm not quite comfortable with in terms of how to uh, defend against online influence campaigns with respect to to uh, generative language models um as i mentioned my own background is in detection of online influence campaigns and there is a lot that you have to grapple with as far as um, trying to understand how these work and also making sure that you don't have any collateral um because even the, the faintest suggestion of, of the suppression of political speech uh, is already an enormous amount of damage uh, to the democratic process uh, and to people's ability to communicate honestly and openly. Um, once, people once you deploy a system that is automatically moderating political speech in particular, um, there's definitely a lot of attention that comes to that and it's going to mean that people end up uh, throwing accusations at each other. They don't want to believe someone else has different opinions. And so they start calling each other bots. It's, it becomes quite toxic quite quickly. Um, so we don't have uh, a whole bunch of, I, I don't have enough hours to go deeply into every element of an online influence campaign, but I, I broadly separate them into commercial and political influence campaigns. Uh, commercial being what we mentioned previously, manipulating uh, social platforms to 
uh, promote a product or smear a competitor. Um, political influence campaign, you're trying to accomplish some goal. You want to be elected mayor. You don't want your opponent to be elected mayor. Uh, and so every time someone mentions your mayor, you have a script set up to say something nasty with chat GPT uh, about them. And a, a key point is that this doesn't necessarily really have to be a lie. Uh, you, this isn't there. It doesn't have to be false information at all. Um, you could just simply post the least flattering uh, information about somebody. But you're the, the fraudulent part is not what you're saying necessarily, but the fact that uh, you're producing this false idea of consensus. You're producing the idea that there is a real person saying these things everywhere, when in reality, it's just you with a political agenda trying to uh, promote this idea. So that's a key point here, is that it's not necessarily about detecting false claims online. Uh, there's definitely value in, say, preventing the spread of, say, COVID misinformation online um, or like health and misinformation online. And, you know, there's definitely balance to be had around that. So did, not to say that detecting false claims isn't important, but just that detecting false claims does not eclipse the problem of influence campaigns. Uh, you can run a influence campaign in, entirely with true information. The, the part that is deceptive is that you're creating fake social media users and organically working your product, your company, or, or some uh, political topic in a conversation. And uh, finally, the notion of cost is important. Uh, you can go out and you can purchase product reviews um, for your website. You can, or for your product, you can, it's actually a very large business. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about adoption. Um, when we look at something like GPT-2, GPT-3 being released and, and OpenAI analyzing that and saying, well, no one's abused it yet. So we're probably okay to release our, our models. And that's, they've, they've definitely kind of had to grapple with this themselves and they've had a release strategy. Um, but once you see adoption by the, the mainstream private sector, that's usually, I, I find a good litmus test for whether or not something's being adopted by the cybercrime sector. If not, they're a little bit ahead sometimes. Uh, basically, if somebody is running a big review mill and they're farming out to various people to go write fake reviews about different products, um, and they find that they now have a tool that can do that for them, uh, they're going to use that. And it's just a, a cost benefit analysis for them, same as any other business. Um, and it's same for, say, a cybercrime syndicate doing some ransomware. Um, they can maybe do some phishing where the initial contact is done by AI with a chatbot, and then eventually a real person uh, takes over uh, to do the final kind of a deployment of their malware or um, scam someone out of their money. It's, uh, it's for them, it's just another tool that they can use to save money. Uh, it's important to realize that, that users aren't much of a defense. Um, we might think that we have a pretty good uh, eye for AI generated content, um, but that's definitely uh, some biases at play there. Um, they, some research has found that uh, individuals accept a connection request from fake individuals on LinkedIn the overwhelming majority of the time. Um, so we aren't necessarily always being critical and we aren't always on guard in every environment. So it's not really right to rely on users to, to protect themselves from uh, this kind of information. And finally, uh, we come to spam and harassment. Uh, there's been some, uh, a couple different real world examples of people using generative language models for, spam, for spamming uh, specifically, uh, but these were by researchers. Um, but at their highest, uh, we had a case where uh, one researcher was able to make it so that 55% of content on a government public comment website was generated by a GPT model. Um, that's uh, pretty extreme, um, but they deleted everything afterwards and they moved on. Uh, similarly, we had a case where someone uh, deployed a bot to produce a large amount of uh, content in the style of 4chan on 4chan, which uh, created a lot of controversy in the AI community. Um, but in each of these cases, uh, what I think is is important in these uh, to note is that it was alwe already possible to spam on these platforms. Um, the benefit of machine generated text here uh, isn't in allowing you to do something that you couldn't do already. It's in allowing you to produce more diverse spam. Uh, you can make it so that your 
content is harder to detect because instead of the messages being duplicates or near duplicates where you could use like a Levenstein edit distance to see if they're the same, um, but you're you're just making it so that they're more unique messages. Um, but if you were running one of these platforms, you could reduce the, the impact of an attack by targeting other signals, such as preventing large volumes of posts from say like proxy or VPN IP ranges, um, or just you know the, the humble CAPTCHA, uh, check if a user is human. Um, you might be able to still do some interesting stuff with the content. Maybe you can do some like semantic embedding similarity between different posts, uh, but definitely the, the best way to defend against spam uh, and large scale posts from individual users is to simply verify that they're human. Um, I mean, nobody wants to fill out a CAPTCHA every time they make a post, so, so there's definitely a usability trade-off. Um, but that doesn't mean that you should be letting people spam, you know, 100 posts from the same account uh, or uh, accept large volumes of posts over VPN without authenticating a user. All right. Uh, on that note, let's uh, discuss detection. So how do common detectors work? Um, detection models are also proliferating right now as people have become aware of, or as adoption rises, people have a lot of, of need for tools to help defend themselves. Um, we can, we break down detectors into three main kind of categories. We've got detectors that leverage large language model features. So those, that includes things like pure large language model classifiers. You can use something like GPT-2 or Grover to just classify whether or not uh, something is machine generated text. Uh, that is you or you can fine tune your own um there's also classifiers that rely on features derived from large language models uh to produce these outputs so uh, something like gpt0 um, uses a gpt2 model to uh, calculate uh what is called uh, burstiness and and also perplexity uh, which effectively measures how uh, likely it is that that content came from a generative language model uh, basically reflecting, okay, is this, as, as a measure goes, how likely is it that this came from this model? And, and a useful uh, property there is that outputs from, uh, so smaller language models can generally be used to get some detection capacity on larger language models, uh, which is a helpful property for us to have in detectors because uh, obviously the large models are very, very large. Uh, so it's good that, you know, a small model trained on the same data set or a similar data set can often do a decent job of detection um, under certain conditions because there are definitely some serious limitations we'll get into. Uh, secondly, we have non-large language model statistical features. This is, um, some of this work is very old, but there are still people working on pure feature-based approaches. Um, and so you can look at, you know, syntax, token or frequencies, and we can do lots of old school NLP uh, language analysis, and you don't need to use an LLM. And that can make it faster. It can help you uh, scale your detector to a larger volume of things. And it can also, in some cases, make it more explainable because you don't have to rely on a large language model. Um, though a sufficiently complex statistical system also may suffer from some similar explainability questions. Um, yeah, and then you have human-aided tools. Uh, so you can build a system where it's designed to be shown to a human analyst and that human analyst makes makes the call and there are definitely some appeals there in terms of having a human in the loop uh, to make those kinds of decisions uh, without having it be a purely algorithmic process which may have a lot of uh, implications uh, so uh, statistical feature-based detection uh, it's been around for a while um, some of the the work in this field uh, based on this, we used, say, translated books. They looked at books that have been translated, and they found that uh, at the time, translation models didn't really use cliches. And so they were able to use, say, um, very handcrafted features around, say, looking for um, the presence of frequencies of different uh, small word strings. But as far as modern, uh, modern uh, statistical features go, a lot of these are still actually useful. Um, frequency features, things like uh, Zipf's Law, uh, if you're if you're not familiar, Zipf's law basically uh, states that uh, the frequency of each token uh, in a language tends to follow this kind of uh, logarithmic relation or this uh, this relationship here, where we have uh, a dramatic kind of decrease in frequency as it progresses. So uh, I have the frequencies of the thirty most common words in the Google uh, web corpus here. And you can see that the frequency of the word the is very, very high. 
and then of is is quite a bit lower but still very very high and and you see this relationship with this long tail um, it's the reason that if you wanted to say learn a language uh it's very very helpful to learn say the most common thousand words in that language um because you can then understand a large volume of the the communication that goes on so uh these frequency features are still useful uh we've uh at least um I haven't checked on chat GPT but uh, recently, people have found that uh, machine-generated text is generally less Zipfian uh, than uh, human language. And that does make sense if you think about how the sampling is being performed. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we look at human-aided methods. Um, but there are many ways to create features. You have uh, co-reference resolution, parse trees, repetitiveness, parts of speech overlap, repetitiveness, uh, supermaximal substrings. There's definitely lots of different options that you can, you can go with. Uh, if you are interested in statistical detection, I highly recommend this paper by Froling and Zubiaga um, about feature-based detection. They have some excellent breakdowns of different types of features and their relative importances. Uh, the OpenAI detector. Uh, this is a great example of an LLM-based detection. There are many others. Uh, you can check our paper for a table of them. Um, it was presented as a work in progress, which is also what I say when I'm worried something won't work well all the time. Um, but it's honestly very good that they're being upfront about these limitations. Uh, and they highlight that this should not be used as a primary decision-making tool. That emphasis is theirs. They, they put that in bold. Um, and so I think that OpenAI actually does a very good job here in demonstrating how you should uh, deploy a detector or how you should present a detector uh, to people who may be wanting to use it. Um, they don't produce an output that says whether it's human or machine. They say whether it's likely machine-generated text or unlikely uh, machine-generated text. And that's a very important uh, distinction to a user. You don't want to produce the false idea that machine-generated, that something is absolutely machine-generated text, 0.99%. Or it's once somebody sees like a, an output score from a model, like 0 0.99, they think in their head, 99% chance that this kid is cheating. Instead of thinking uh, the more accurate thing, which is the output of this model may or may not be well calibrated. Uh, I got a positive detection, but it could be confidently incorrect. Uh, and that's absolutely one of the limitations of this kind of approach. Um, but yes, be careful when you're presenting the outputs of these models, um, but these are definitely very powerful. Uh, OpenAI previously released one with the GPT-2 1.5 billion parameter model. Um, I would be very interested in seeing how this one, uh, this newer detector API uh, holds up to that. Uh, Giant Language Model Test Room, or GLTR, is a great example of a human-aided approach. Um, it takes a little bit of getting used to to read the text well, um, but it effectively relies on trained humans to perform analysis by visualizing how likely uh, individual words are based on uh, a top case sampling method or the fraction of probability a given token has compared to all other tokens. Um, to, to illustrate, so I've got the, the classic GPT-2 prompt in here. Uh, it's the, the Ovid's unicorn uh, text. So this first part is written by a human. And you see that uh, using top K sampling, uh, the words here are a little bit more unusual. We have uh, some words that are below the top 1,000 tokens in terms of what token might come next. And so a language model is less likely to have selected these tokens as the next uh, token to put in the sentence. So quick crash course in how these models work. They, they generate a score of probabilities across different next tokens, and they need to select one. Um, back in the day, they used top K. Now they use something called nucleus sampling, which uh, samples from a kind of changing probability mass. But the important part is that if you look at generated text, you can kind of determine whether or not it's likely machine human text, like this first part, or machine text is bottom part. So if you're reading this and you notice, OK, hang on, I don't see a lot of purple, and there I don't see a lot of red even, this is a lot of very likely words as far as the, the neural network decoder. Um, no, not the decoder, as far as the, the sampling method is concerned. Uh, and so what you'd have is a human reading this, and the human has their own intuition about whether or not it's machine or human text. But when they combine that human intuition with um, the visualization, that can help them improve scores. And that's what the authors of this paper found. Um, you'd probably want to modernize it a bit to, to maybe align better with the modern sampling methods. Um, but I, I definitely think that this is an interesting idea. 
Uh, and a fun, uh, fun, a, a valuable property uh, found by some other researchers was that human detection of machine generated text is, uh, so machine detection of computer generated text is strongest when humans are fooled. That's, that's this common idea that if a machine is producing an output that is uh, positive and a, it, it, if it's producing an output that a human finds interesting or acceptable, it likely had to limit its sampling from a distribution somehow, and, and therefore it's easier to detect. Um, we saw this in style GAN detection uh, as well. For uh, imagery detection, uh, you'd see something that if you if you truncated your features to sample from the prettier part of the model, um, then you're producing less diverse outputs, and and your automated detectors would suddenly work a lot better. Um, so definitely uh, keep keep that in mind so that humans combined with machines can actually be quite powerful in this particular area. Uh, common detector limitations, uh, sequence length. Uh, we struggle a lot with short sequences. If somebody posts a, a, like, a tweet length type of text, it's very hard to detect with just one of those alone. Um, but if you were dealing with a whole bunch of tweets, maybe you would have a better result. So if you're say doing social media moderation, you would want to work with maybe uh, multiple comments at once uh, rather than say running a detector on just um, a uh, single instance and then trying to go from there. Uh, they can be confidently incorrect. Uh, confidence can be high on incorrect predictions. Uh, be very careful about confidence scores. Um, and yeah, and adversarial attacks. Uh, obviously, if you are trying to get away with using one of these, the first thing you're going to do is, is run it yourself against any open source detector you can find. You're going to uh, maybe try swapping some words around. Maybe you'll write a script to do automatically do some uh, switching of words with unlikely synonyms or, or just find other ways to foil detectors. Uh, so do be aware that um, this is not something where you can just set up an algorithm and detect it uh, in isolation forever. So uh, some key takeaways. We, we covered a lot of different threat models. Um, there's definitely more uh, in the paper and otherwise. Uh, what can we do next and how do we respond to ChatGPT? Uh, some guidance for those building detectors. Uh, definitely follow OpenAI's lead uh, in tuning detectors so that the false positive rate is low. Um, it's often a lot safer to do it this way uh, in most contexts. Uh, perhaps you have your own context where you want to uh, make a different choice. That's okay. But um, it is definitely, in a lot of cases, better and safer to make sure that false positives are low. Um, consider that samples may only be partially AI generated. Um, somebody may only use AI for part of a, of a particular work. They may produce, say, you know, the first sentence of a fake social media comment and then have AI generate the rest. Again, also ask yourself whether or not there's legitimate uses in that particular context. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, do think about adversarial robustness. Um, something that I found in my own research is that diverse statistical features can improve adversarial robustness of detection models. Um, so if you combine, say, the output of a large language model as a feature, and then you add maybe some of those uh, statistical features, it can be hard for someone to design an adversarial attack that fools both without destroying their text to the point where it becomes very difficult for their target to actually understand it. And yeah, be careful how you present the results of your de detection. Uh, humans are prone to oversimplification. If you tell them 0 0.99, they will likely believe you um, that uh, that's uh, a reliable confidence. For those using detectors, uh, often it's not a good idea to take action based on a single positive detection result. Um, you want to be very careful about that. Uh, make sure you have a process in place whereby maybe you say, say you're a teacher, you're looking at multiple essays. Maybe you should wait for a few different essays to come back with a high positive score um, before you, you know, start talking to a student and start figuring out what's going on. Uh, compare, you might want to compare, say, their writing in class to their writing in the in the essay. All that to say, we may be overly focusing on that particular use case, given that there's a lot of different uses uh, for detectors right now. And I'm sure that a lot of people are building those right now. Um, yeah, decisions that have a significant adverse impact on individuals uh, must be made by humans. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. Um, I think that automated decision making guidelines from the EU uh, in Canada and elsewhere uh, tend to encapsulate this idea uh, that you shouldn't uh, make these kinds of decisions without human oversight, and you should absolutely make sure to integrate those and to be aware of those kind of uh, frameworks. And yeah, be aware that 
even when you use a detector or deploy detector, you may also be incurring some trade-off of trust of your users. And be prepared to address that. Uh, be open about what you're doing and, and prove to people that what you're doing is ethical and reasonable. Um, otherwise, you risk creating more toxicity and more kind of suspicion uh, in our online communities. And, and going beyond detection. Uh, AI text doesn't change logistical challenges in many attacks. Uh, it can complicate detection, but uh, keep in mind that the rules of the world uh, have not been completely rewritten. Uh, a person still needs to, uh, say, send a malware payload if they're going to deploy malware. Uh, someone still does need to query a generative language model if they want to add that to their attacks. So um, do be aware that other still logistical challenges they may have to keep in mind. Uh, we may have to change how we design assignments or interview job candidates, evaluate papers, um, and be ready to pair, say, your detection approach with maybe some changes to the way that you, you do things. Um, and finally, we'll say that there's a, there's a common interest in a trustworthy internet where humans are interacting authentically. Uh, and so yeah, methods to protect that, such as real ID verification, should be balanced against individual privacy concerns and uh, make sure that uh, we aren't losing Make sure that we we do this in a responsible way, where we're not, say, giving up all of our privacy to a company um, in the name of making sure we're all real. Um, just, just trying to to do that in a responsible way. Um, definitely, you could have whole talks on that topic alone. As far as the evolving disruption in my own house, uh, we figured out a lot. We're still developing strategies to manage things. We're improvising and being flexible. Here's my wife Annie. She's eating breakfast out of a mug while wearing our kid, and and Aaron is playing with a lid from a leftover container. Uh, we're improvising. We're staying flexible. Uh, she's getting more mobile, so the threat models are definitely proliferating in our house right now. Um, but but each stage in an evolving disruption, you need to reevaluate what you're doing. You need to keep being flexible uh, to deal with the new kind of capabilities that are coming out. So keep that in mind. Uh, Keep adapting, uh, keep putting people first, your users, uh, the people in your society who may be more vulnerable. Uh, keep those people in mind when you're building solutions and you'll be, we'll all be better off for it. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you're researching detection or managing uh, social changes, generative AI would bring, I'd love to hear from you, collaborate with you. I realize I've gone a bit long. Thank you very much for giving me the time to, to wrap up. Thanks, Project. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have now time for a few questions. I already see some questions in, in, in the chat. Uh, yeah, so let us start with this uh, yeah, relation between like detection tools and adversarial training. So like uh, the question is, can we still, is it still possible to, 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 to have to apply the text detection tools even these models were trained uh, adversarially? Yeah, uh, that's a that's I think the one of the primary questions in detection, um, and I I would say that it absolutely doesn't mean that detection tools aren't useful just because people can adversarially train them. Um, you see the same thing in cybersecurity for for decades now, where somebody will create a antivirus program that looks for certain network signatures, and then uh, the malware developer will download that antivirus program and make sure to change their traffic so that it avoids it. Uh, I think that uh, if you have a diverse range of features, you can make the adversarial attacks very difficult or the adversarial training uh, very difficult to uh, succeed consistently at. And I would say that that's probably um, where research will probably continue to drive as far as detection goes. Mm -hmm. Another question, should all machine generated texts have an underlying metadata that automatically registers in, in digital media as a non-human generated language? Well, I mean, there's a couple questions there. I mean, the should it all have underlying metadata that I didn't, I think that people should always have um, knowledge when they're interacting with a machine or with machine generated text. I think preemptively disclosing that you're interacting with a machine or that text was written by AI is, is a very good thing to do. Um, but I, I don't see it realistically that you could actually do something like that. Uh, there are open source models. Um, and even if uh, you were to <laughs> try to create some kind of metadata signature on all the open source ones, you'd have a criminal just go in and you know train their own or fine tune their own to bypass that kind of signature. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I have a question. I'm very much important, uh, interested in explainability of, of machine learning models. So do, do you think we can learn something from explanations? So can we explain the detectors? Can we can we learn more about like maybe also the limitations of, of, of GPT-3 or GPT models? Yeah, I think that uh, explanations are very like, um, when we're talking about transformer language models, we might be looking at something like uh, attention head activations, or we might look at input feature attributions. I think that's a very understudied area right now in terms of how adversarial attacks uh, against, say, like a detector of computer generated text work. I think that there's there's definitely it's definitely worth understanding uh, how, uh, say, a modification. I, I, I've been looking recently at the problem of uh, if you do an adversarial attack against a a input sample, does the explanation change uh, as a result of that? And how does that explanation change? And so you see something like an attack. There's an attack called deep word bug, for example, that swaps a couple characters or or changes typos and adds them to text to bypass a detector or a classifier. And so if we use an explainability method that does um, input feature attributions, we can see how the tokens are then being broken down. And we realize that maybe it's more about how the how we're doing tokenization that's actually allowing us to be vulnerable to this attack. Um, and so maybe if we had ways of embedding words where we would embed them similar to how, how a human would. So something like, uh, like as someone might not notice that, like if someone wrote the word incredible and they switched two letters in the middle, a human probably won't notice that. So I think there's definitely some interesting kind of ideas that can come out of looking at explainability or, or say, feature attributions and transformers or things like that. Mm -hmm. And another question about like, like how, yeah, if, if these models are really generating anything, or if they are just stitching together, combining things that they already saw before somehow. So like, wh what is the relation in your experience between like, memorization and like really creating something something new yeah uh, there's definitely uh i mean there's definitely plenty of instances of observed memorization um you can get specific content out of it and i, I feel like that really inhibits its usage as say like a writing assistant um i in my own writing writing this survey paper even though i was tempted at many points to use it i i never used a generative language model simply because I didn't want to have to spend all the time Googling and searching for every single piece of text to make sure it wasn't just uh, picking it up from somewhere. Um, I, I would say that it's, it is beyond simple memorization. Obviously, the way it's sampling and combining different phrases together does uh, transcend pure memorization in my mind. Um, but I don't think of them as particularly intelligent, and I don't think of them as particularly um, uh, com complex in that manner. Mm -hmm. And so, how does it like relate to copyright uh, issues? So, if 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 oh, if the model, so how can we be sure that no no like text is taken from somewhere, which is again, yeah, yeah I think copyright issue. I, I think you definitely have to um, if you're going to use a system like this. It's useful to have. So, for those building the models, uh, I think that a good approach is to uh, do a a search of your own training data for similar bodies of text to try to see if you can match. Um, you're effectively having to do a Google style search against your own training corpus to try to find whether or not you've produced something similar to this before. And then, you know, use some kind of measure to determine if it's original. Um, the copyright, as far as say, like, is it right that we, I, I, Stable Diffusion has a lot of these questions too, where you're asking yourself, um, you know, say an artist produces a whole bunch of things, or say in our case in text, if we're producing a large volume of scientific writing, do the people that you're sampling from uh, have some kind of right to the the knowledge that they've now imparted to the machine that everyone gets to use? Or, or do we decide that it's better that everyone has that access to that machine? And that's more important than the rights of the people who produced a particular work. Um, we may have to rethink how we think about copyright. Um, and how we think about the common public good potential of, of generative language models. Mm -hmm. And another question relating to detection. I mean, are there other ways to validate that that a human has put like text in, uh, for example, like validating that the text was entered in a physical keyboard 
or maybe to put the, the, the question like even even bigger, can you think of of ways where we as human could kind of prove to the system that we are human, for example, by re relating to things which rely on some physical experience. So for example, how does it feel when if, if you shave uh, after shaving or things which a machine maybe never experience uh, it, itself? So can you think of, of more yeah, advanced ways of validating uh, the detection algorithm? Yeah, it's it's difficult to do it with the content itself, because if someone has talked about any of those feelings at some point, it may be able to reproduce text as if it as if it had itself. The current model from uh, OpenAI ChatGPT is quite good at at hedging its own explanations unless you are quite creative with your prompt. Um, but uh, for some of those other things, like, say, detecting someone's physical keystrokes, uh, that's absolutely incredibly uh, I, as far as like. Um, uh, online validation goes. I, I love that whole kind of interesting uh, rabbit hole of can you figure out um, that it is in fact a human just by the way that they type on the keyboard? You know, mm -hmm. the way they reach for the the P key on their keyboard, does it show you like, oh, hey, like there's no way that they're an AI because an AI would randomly perhaps vary their um, keystrokes, but a human, you know, has keys that they're quick at hitting and ones that they're slow at hitting, or maybe they make a typo when they go back, like things that an AI or that a automated system doesn't do. Um, so there's definitely some creative things. I know someone who's working with continuous authentication. So stuff like um, making sure that a human is using a device at all times, and you could potentially tie something like that uh, into using other tools as well. But um, again, there's a privacy kind of consideration there too, that we have to be careful of. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ewan. So thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and the very nice discussion. And yeah, take care and see you soon. Bye Thanks bye. so much. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for good program. Let's shape the future of AI for good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.
Mm-hmm.